Hey, I'm Adam Small. And I'm Jake Moses. This is our podcast, The Performer's Pathway. A podcast adventure to help guide and navigate your musical life and career. As a prelude to every episode, we'd like to remind our listeners that this podcast is about the other side of the musical coin. One side, which you see at our website, mymusicmasterclass.com, is what to do in the practice room. But the other side is how to maximize your talent and skills in the real world. And that's what this podcast is about. Also, if you have a few extra seconds to spare, which is technically only three beats at 60 BPM, please subscribe to our show on your podcast app of choice and rate us five stars. And don't forget to leave a comment. Your support will help us expand our audience and create new episodes. And lastly, word of mouth is always super helpful. So if you like what you hear, please tell the world. Before we get started here, I want to mention our guidebook slash workbook called The Motivated Musician. It's geared towards serious musicians and it offers challenges, exercises, professional advice and more to help keep your musical life and career on track. Also, as an extra perk, members get exclusive discounts from My Music Masterclass. And if you want to learn more, just go to MyMusicMasterclass.com, hit subscribe in the header menu and you'll be good to go. All right. So we're here today. This is our second time doing video with our podcast, and we're super excited to have Steve Jenkins with us, who's, uh, you know, a New Yorker I've known for a bit um, because, you know, he's on the website. He's also an amazing bassist. He's a great solo artist. He's got some very cool records. He's played as a sideman with, um, I know, Screaming Headless Torsos with Fizinski. Uh Vernon Reed was a great one. Um, and you know i know you did stuff at victor wooden's camp um and all these other things and he's a monster player but he's also a super cool guy and a really smart dude with some really cool perspectives and i thought it'd be great to hear what he has to say what do you think anyway it's great to have you man thanks for having me and thanks for the nice intro oh man that's <laughs> yeah, the least the i could I do an intro god <laughs> no no you don't get an intro but man so what what have you been doing recently um you know i don't know let's start from the beginning of this pandemic i know that you're in la now so steve i knew Mm -hmm. steve when he was in new york and um Mm -hmm. he was a berkeley cat originally and then came down was working a bunch decided to move to la much like i did um except that i moved back to the east coast when you moved to la um so how was that transition for you and like I guess start from that because that's kind of an interesting topic in itself, you know, um, moving coast to coast, right? Well, so I moved to, to LA in early 2017. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. And um, I had been in New York for 13 years and I kind of felt like I was at the end of the line. Um, like in term, not, not that like things were going badly, but I just didn't really know what else I wanted to do there, you know? And I don't, it's interesting now, as I'm talking about this, I have a different view of what maybe I was experiencing, but I think I knew I really wasn't interested in doing like Broadway at all. Yeah. Right. Like I tried it and it just wasn't yeah. for me. And I think, I'm not attacking that that lane that people choose, but I just know that like, but you, it's kind of like like, a, like like a pit musician kind of thing. yeah, like being yeah. A, being I mean, a, it's kind of a big thing in New York. I mean, especially for yeah. stability at this point, you know. Well, yeah. not now. COVID fucked everything up, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like I I I'm not sliding because I know it's like a, a whole other thing. But my my uh, take on that was well, if I have to fight my way into a different scene, I'll just go to a different city. Cause maybe it's yeah. just time to do that. And, um, there was a good convergence of the, the roommate I had, he was getting serious with his girlfriend. And so she was going to move in, which meant I had to move out anyway. Uh, yeah. and I just, when I moved into that place, I kind of knew this is my last little bit of time in New York and then I'm going to leave, you know? Yeah. So I, I lived in that place for like a year and maybe eight months and I was, I'd already, kind of prepared myself in the beginning of 2016 that like I probably won't last the year in New York and I'm going to move and check it out. So, you know, I did some recon, like I went to LA 
in September of 2016, basically sublet at a friend's place who was going to be gone. And so I got wasn't to check that, it out. Wasn't that like due to Nam? I was going to say that's like the perfect time. I to, thought that you went that. there. Didn't you stay at Travis's place? I did for a little bit. Like oh, that okay. was like when I was looking for a place. But, I get it. um, it's a good scouting time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up, yeah, Travis actually helped me find a place. So when I got out here, I, I was living, I was sharing a house with a friend of ours who, uh, he was going through some personal stuff. Like I think he and his wife were splitting and he needed someone to help, you know, offset some of the costs of living in a house. So I landed there for a few months and it was cool. And then I finally got my own place and I've been there ever since I can't, so I don't really know what's happening in LA, man. Like I've been here <laughs> for that long and I don't know if I'm staying. COVID yeah. hit at a weird time because um, I feel like from the time I landed here to now, I haven't really done anything that's justified me coming out here. Like I've done some yeah. touring with different people, um, which I don't want to sound dark, but like I'm 45. So I've like done some shit and like, I've had experiences, so it's like it's different. My experience on or my my take on it now is different than if I was like 25. But it's just like I I didn't the last, especially the last experience I had touring. Uh, that was one of those come to Jesus moments for me, man. Where it's like I don't think I want to do this anymore unless I can do it on a level that's like better than this and i've done stuff like that before like i mean this is a situation where and i don't i don't think it matters who who I, if i name the person but i'm not going to um oh no i know who it is and that's all that matters yeah and, and, um and, and the, the reason i'll write it in the description shit, of the youtube but that shit matters like the the level of like what you're doing out there because it it becomes your living situation i mean that's, that's a huge no i mean deal. i know what you mean steve i mean and the thing is that like the artists that will rename well what is it remain unnamed like yeah. like Voldemort is um <laughs> you know he's 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 cool he's a good he's a really good guitarist and he had his time and it's like that it's that level of like touring which right yeah I know exactly what you mean it's a good it's probably a fun gig and all that stuff yeah it just you know the business side of it wasn't tight and yeah. it imploded a couple weeks after we started I had that to chase sucks. my money down, which was not cool. And nah. I would say from that standpoint, 2019 was a worse year for me musically than 2020. Right. Even yeah. though 2020 was awful, like I was entering 2020 kind of in reset mode. Like I was just kind of stoked to play. And, you know, like I, I was so pissed from that tour that like it took me a few months to kind of figure it out, you know? And, I, and what I realized is that like, that thing that I was talking about in the beginning of this answer, like where something made me want to leave New York. I think I've hit that point where I'm trying to pick and choose what parts of this I still want to do and the parts that like mean the most to me. And I think it's still possible to do that. But I think this idea of like trying to sort of like bow to this invisible hand that's going to keep you doing stuff. Like I don't buy that anymore, man. I think, I think, you can make your own happiness in this. And I think there's things that just suck and that's part of the deal. And, you know, we all have our gripes, but I think I got to the place where it's like, okay, there isn't really a be all end all situation out here. There's a great lifestyle. There's great yeah. musicians. So I don't, I'm not upset that I moved, but I feel like some of the things I discovered had more to do with me than my location. And I wasn't expecting that. So, so maybe just like a timing kind of thing, just fucking. Yeah. Yeah. But that's actually everything. kind of like, that's like a soul searching kind of thing that, yeah. you know, it just it was happenstance. And it's true, though, because what you said is a lot of what I experienced. So I moved to Los Angeles when I don't know. I mean, what is it? 2008 around. And yeah, I was there for about seven years. And my goal originally was to get more licensing work and writing for television work because I was starting to do that in New York and getting gigs, but obviously there's more of that. So as a bass player, I knew I could always work because it's like what I did and how I started. And, you know, it's easier to, to, to pick up a gig than to, you know, write something quickly. Like I could always pick up a gig and make money, um, to a certain degree. And, um, anyway, I found that 
it was a different package and there were some things that are better, right? I mean, like quality of life, if since I grew up in New York, I mean, it was nice that it didn't snow, you know what I mean? It was nice that you, every place has got like a dishwasher in it. It's not falling apart, you know what I mean? You have like a balcony, <laughs> like, um, mm -hmm. and, and things are cheaper on the peripheral, but when you look inside, you have to get a car and insurance and all the stuff that you wouldn't have in the city. So it evens out. But um, it does, yeah. But yeah, you know, there's a different side to the industry I found. And I don't know if, if you found this as well, like uh, in terms of the scene. But for me, I've told this story many times. Like I did this pop audition and they had the the bass in the monitors, like <laughs> like playing as I was playing the audition. Like they really didn't give a shit what I sounded like, you know. And it was for like a Sony artist, you know. And I'm like, did I wear the right hat or is the guy with the blue mohawk going to get it, you know? Right. So that's kind of like... <laughs> You know, it, it is a part of the industry. And if you can't accept that and you're salty about it, then you should like not be doing it. You know, I mean, because that if for instance, you know, and Ruslan Sirota said it very um, elegantly, like when I talked to him about uh, people being pissed about the weekends band, like having to pay for their own plane tickets or something like that for the Super Bowl, I think it was. And he said, well, you know, I mean, the problem is that there's a lot of people that can do that gig. You know what I mean? And that that's what it is. It's not right. It's shitty. But yeah. it's like when you're in a position like that, yeah, you, you know, shit cards. happens. And I, from what I know of you, uh, you know, you're a smart cat. Do you, you still enjoy probably writing and, and, and doing your own thing and all that? So are you going to put more eggs in that basket? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, I don't really think I was ever really cut out for that other thing. Um, but I don't begrudge people who are into that stuff. Cause I think there's like really good players that find themselves in that world who do a lot of things, totally. you know? And, and I don't have a problem with like, I personally don't have a problem with like the entertainment part of the business. You know, I think, I think it's important to remember that like, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, people, I actually kind of respect people that work in that field uh, or that, that section of the field who kind of can do a few different things. Like, it's interesting to hear their take on it, but, but I think at the end of the day, that's, I think that it's just a lane that people decide they're either into or not, you know, but I don't think what I, I think the one thing that musicians should understand is like, nobody's really winning more by being in that lane. Not yeah. really like not because to me, like, I think if someone really wants to be in that world and they want to be an MD or they want to tour with pop artists and stuff, or, then, you know, like if that's what makes them happy, that's what's that's probably what's going to, you know, be the thing that they strive for. But I don't know, man, <laughs> I think I think there's a lot of different ways people can find their bliss if they're doing it professionally. I just I think what I've realized is like a lot of it's going to come from me carving out my own thing and finding people that either find that a value and that's how I get employed versus, you know, as a side musician. Um, but I don't know, man, it's, it's, I, I don't know if it's always such a black and white thing because I think if the right thing came along, I would never rule myself out of doing anything like that. But you know, it's like, right. I just, I just think ultimately there's myths about all of that stuff. And if people knew what some of those cats actually made that are not on the upper end of those things, they would they would be like, really? Like, you know, because I can make more money playing a wedding gig. When make wedding more gigs money are... teaching. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you have a good Plus, private like lesson you... set up, like yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. So Plus, I, you, know, you know the tunes are ready for the wedding gig most of the times, you know? Right. I think it's about time, and I think it's more about the overarching thing. I mean, I, I think for me, my goals now are just I want to get paid to be me. And yeah. if that means I got to teach or make my own, make my own thing, or, you know, at this point I'm, I'm kind of embraced the idea of content creation and I haven't completely done the 180 with that yet, but I'm close to it, you know? Um, Cause I tested the waters. I did like a podcast last year, which is, I'm going to revisit, but it was mostly just about the initial, what are people going to do while we're in this pandemic, you know, yeah, right. but it, that's a tough angle to sustain because things are morphing and, right. you know. Plus, like, the, the podcast would still be going on with the same fucking question because we're still in this thing. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. we're, we're slowly 
coming out of it. I remember yeah. we ordered like um, a, a handful of masks because we're like, oh, you know, we'll make some My Music Master masks, you know, whatever. And uh, of course, you know, we sold out recently or I don't know, a few months ago. And I'm like, do I get more? I mean, I didn't really expect, to, you know, like this shit to, to last this long. Yeah, just get like laminated uh, <laughs> vaccination uh, card things. Yeah, just sell you know. them. Yep. But it just says like, your instrument on it or something like that <laughs> yeah. so some some niche yeah. they really just like after all that stuff like today i got my card and they were just like that's all there is they're like don't lose it <laughs> like, yeah. she's like it, we can't even we can't even backtrack it and like find it until like years from now so don't lose wow. it like if i scanned it. it into my phone oh that's nice. right. yeah exactly yeah that's like one of the coolest features with like uh i scanned it into my phone and i locked it in the notes yep. so basically you have to use face <laughs> recognition to get to it there you go perfect um, but yeah i don't i don't know i think i think it's it's okay to um try to diversify a little bit but i i think one interesting thing that i've noticed is almost counter to what a lot of the advice was maybe 15 years ago it's like i think the idea of being a specialist now is probably the smartest thing people can do even if it's not yeah. You know, even if even if you might shoot yourself in the foot as like a side musician because people aren't going to completely understand what your capabilities are, like just if you do that. But I think to a certain extent, like that, that's kind of the thing people are doing now, right? You know, like yeah. in a, in a weird way. I mean, I think that you're onto something, especially now. I I was just right. I had to write this article about cutting through the crowd, you know, and and a big piece of that is, you know whatever search engine like seo right because you do web stuff so i mean but it's more about seo it's about it starts with it's like a guitarist or a bass player like it starts in your hands right so before that it starts on screen like your talent and it's not just how good you are but like how you come across how you show yourself and we're we're all kind of trying to carve this niche and and if you don't i don't know if you don't have something special or different like it's not really going to jive anymore. Like, I don't think you can be a jack of all trades, like with all the noise, you know what I mean? Like all the noise from everything. Do you yeah. agree? Like, like you should almost be the best at this or just have a really cool thing. And then you get your numbers up and then people are interested. And what does that equate to? I mean, it's tricky. You know, I've talked to a lot of different people about, uh, what Instagram, I, Mike Moreno actually had a really good, uh, algorithm almost he said that this he had a percentage of people that follow him on social media and the percentage of those people who will act on something that he's selling like a, a live stream or whatever and mm -hmm. it was low you know i mean it, it was like whatever what was it like 20 percent or something like that or i don't yeah. remember yeah but you know so it's it's about yeah finding finding what you can do to shine and and also what makes you happy i mean isn't that the ultimate goal you know i mean because yeah. if it's not you're just going to be depressed well, that's what i was going to say about like city life too you talk about new york i think if once you make a move to a big city the the only mm -hmm. job the city has is to fucking keep you inspired because mm -hmm. <laughs> you're sacrificing yeah fucking so many things to, to live yeah. there it's expensive it's annoying it's batshit crazy you know so like if that inspiration stops because like i've been in la now since 09 and it's like if i didn't wake up and feel some sort of fuck yeah i can like kind of do whatever i want i can like figure shit out and make a business whatever like if i didn't have that feeling anymore i'd just be like i gotta get the hell out of here because it's not worth it you know so maybe that was like the new york thing for you you know yeah but then you just you moved here and it kind of just was a bad time maybe <laughs> well i i really like la i mean that's the thing yeah. in spite of whatever you know i mean i i can't i mean i like the thing like whatever my gripes were about like or just from the angle of saying well it hasn't really haven't really found what i came out here to do i can't say that like the things i did were bad you know like i yeah i did a tour with josh smith that was cool nice. um did some other stuff i mean it was fun to do that do i feel like that was the right place for me to be no not at all but it was fun um yeah uh you know and like it, it's weird like i i did like I, I listened to this track i played bass on uh like i think it was like two years ago like it was in 2019 it was like uh 
this guy Gussie Miller, who's Marcus's cousin. And it was oh, like nice. this smooth, kind of like this smooth jazz uh, <laughs> R&B song. And it was like that dude Herman Matthews on drums and this oh, man. really great guitar player named Tony Polizzi, who's, you know, like then yeah. they do a lot of like smooth jazz stuff. Herman played with Tower of Power. And like sure. I hadn't listened to that recording in a minute. And I was like, damn, I, I actually sound like I play this shit, man. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's like um, you forget about it totally. It was just like, oh, shit, I did that. It's you like know? sometimes you have to completely forget about it in order to like appreciate what you actually did. Yeah, it was it was fun, though, man. I remember like we banged it out fast. And, you know, so there's been like a lot of trying on things out here. But I think, I mean, I had the same realization in New York to a certain degree where it's like, man, you know, I, I moved to New York with a record out. I had just put out my first record. It got press in like uh, magazines and stuff like jazz is and bass player. And, you know, I was completely independent, so I didn't have a label trying to put me on the road. But I, I do think that like ultimately that could have been some I, that I have a regret of not doing more to pro plug my own thing. You know, just yeah. like the whole idea, because because I think there's things about the East Coast that are inherently advantageous compared to LA and, and there's, it works the other way also. Like um, the one thing about the East coast that's interesting is you can literally go to like five different cities yeah, in a really short amount of time. And they're pretty big markets. Yeah. Cause you, you mean like, like going New to York, Philly and Jersey and in, Philly, yeah. New Jersey, like Boston, yeah. Boston, Providence, Boston totally. New York. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Providence, DC. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I try to look at LA like that, like little independent cities, you know, whether you're in like Silver Lake or, you know, but it's not, it's not the same <laughs> shit. It's not the like, same. Like New England and, and the East Coast, it's, it's nooks and crannies, man. Like California is just a fucking, you yeah, know, but, just a, the whole coast. But, you know, <laughs> but I lived in Silver Lake and, you know, for years and people that were near you in Culver, they'd be like, oh man, no, that shit, that's just too far, yeah. man. I'm not coming yeah, over I'd there. I'd go there to drink coffee <laughs> with Adam, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go yeah, get exactly. coffee oh, in Silver Lake. What the fuck's wrong leave with it. people? Like, yeah. Let's yeah. leave two hours early because we got to get on the 10, you know? Yeah, I used to drive. Where from would like, you go to coffee there? You know, oh God, um, what was the place that we went to? Intelligentsia the is the bomb. We'd walk to, though. That one was dope. It was just like a no-name coffee, little... The coffee table, I don't think it's around anymore. And then there's that yeah. one in Atwater that was dope. Um, yeah. That one was cool, too. Like, I forget the name had, of like, it. like belts made from like leather that the guy found in like, you know, 1280. <laughs> and then there was like, it was exactly. just like the most random shop with like it's some hipster oh, you shit. could buy like a $700,000 belt or get a cup of coffee. You know? <laughs> wow. It was like what, yeah. what Bernstein was talking about with uh, the monocle, the monocle shop. store. <laughs> yeah. Pete Bernstein was saying that there was a monocle store in seventh. I didn't ever realize that. It's like for the people that don't want to order their monocles online, you know, you have to get them in person at the monocle store. Wow. But, he was like, those businesses know. are in trouble. He's like, no one's ever bought anything from those places ever. Yeah, They're I obviously know. just like rich owners. But like now even well, those places are in trouble for COVID, you know? I mean, it could be, a, like, I mean, it could be a front. I mean, for all we know. I mean, it's kind of nuts. Oh, God, you Jesus. Know? It's a whole other conference. That's a different podcast. But, exactly. No, but I mean, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's definitely... A journey for everyone and it kind of sounds like you found yours because it's not about rejection it's not about lack of talent it's about finding like what you really want to do and figuring out how to do that and be happy and you know the sideman thing is something that a lot of people are capable of like we talked about like if you have a certain skill level you can do that but there is a lot of game playing that has to happen in the pop world especially in los angeles um, I mean, in New York too. I mean, it's a, it's it's, it's very, just not a fun feeling. No, I mean, you definitely while, work. You, know? you definitely get the feeling that you're like really working for someone, as opposed to yeah. like being at all friendly. You know, in yeah, like this is your role. Ways. You don't go above and yeah. beyond it. You know, just which is cool and up. <laughs> it is good for for a certain thing. Yeah. No, I mean, it can be cool. Um, I remember talking to Travis Carlton about that. Um, once at the baked potato, we were talking and, and we were talking about like those auditions, and he was saying the same thing like he's just like man i i'm just not cut out for it you know like i've yeah. done a few when i was younger and you know this just whatever it's not my thing and <laughs> he's obviously a beast you know i mean so it doesn't matter yeah. he does his thing so but you know it's like not everyone's cut out to do pop auditions or any of that stuff and at the same time a lot of those pop guys um you know or pop people you know 
they can they can do anything. I mean, a lot of them are amazing musicians, and they choose to do that because they love it. So, I mean, whatever it makes yeah. you feel good, you know. But yeah. it's tr it's tricky, you know. But so, like, what have you? I know that you um got into some some of the cool nerdy shit that I do. You know, I mean, like some of the coding and all that. Um, I find it relaxing to do random stuff like that. Is that kind of where you're at with it, and just like learning new skills and kind of getting involved and also in maybe you know merging that with what you're doing musically and all that or how, how you feel about it yeah i mean i i definitely like exploring stuff like that i think for me it's more the idea of being able to learn new things uh and just being able to figure out ways to understand how things work um the latest thing i've been kind of messing around with is blender because totally it's kind of a fun <laughs> it's kind of cool um and yeah like i have a 3d friend, printer yeah oh yeah yeah i don't use blender but i i mean i know it because of that yeah i just i like stuff like that that and that kind of is my approach to a lot of stuff with music like i just like messing with stuff and seeing what i can do with it so yeah i mean that that tends to just sometimes when i want to like take a break from something i think it's one of those things where i just like to prove to myself that if i start with something i don't know anything about after a few hours i have a little bit of like fluency with it you know like i can right. kind of you know it it hasn't turned into the kind of thing where um you know i'm not ready to like look for jobs with any of that stuff no. necessarily but like i think the idea of not wanting to feel shackled to the music business is, is has always yeah. been kind of important to me because i think i think that's the weird part about doing this that they don't teach you about uh in schools that i think only people maybe who have like parents or or, fa or uh family members that are lifers would probably be able to teach which is that like you're gonna have ups and downs and sometimes when you're in the valleys of it you might want to like just take a break or cut back on what you're doing so you know like i mean i <laughs> I, i've worked day gigs before while i was out in the world you know like where i had records being reviewed or i played on records that were being reviewed in magazines it's, and was sort it's of nice known. sometimes man it's yeah. a nice feeling especially because it's I like you get it. to hang with you get to hang with non-musicians and like they're super interested in what you do they're like holy shit you do all that <laughs> like yeah yeah <laughs> also i do this shit you know it's like it's good it kind of keeps you in reality too musicians yeah. can get a little crazy if they're <laughs> yeah and it's, <laughs> it's also just like a natural way to it's a natural way to unwind from yeah. your, you know, constant bombardment of the business. And, you know, even, and I, I've said this a lot to different people, but essentially if you're full time and you're gigging seven nights a week or whatever the case is, and just on overdrive, like you're going to hit a wall no matter who you are and mm -hmm. you're going to have to unwind. So some people want to just walk in the woods or surf. And, but a yeah. lot of times people don't do anything for themselves and they just end up kind of burning out right. so i mean what better activity than doing something that is not music and it it's fun for you and relaxing but also can lead to making money i mean that's a, that's a win-win yeah well you know when i because i had that thing happen where um you know i played with with fusinski's music for like five years so that that included screaming on those torsos uh, only touring and then he had a trio and I did a lot with that like we, we made a record and you know that was a thing that I felt really cool to be involved with because creatively I guess when that mattered to me more there was some validation there it's like I'm playing with one of my heroes blah 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 mm -hmm. but inevitably all these types of things come to an end and you know I didn't I'd never been in a situation that kind of had that arc so when it ended I think I was feeling a couple things, which is like I was bummed, but it was, I didn't feel like it was the wrong place for it to be. Cause I feel like, well, you know, five years is a long time. But I think also, you know, that question they always ask musicians like, or, you know, you guys are probably always, you guys have probably had this question thrown at you. Like what's your ultimate gig, you know? <laughs> and, and like, yeah. I feel like I, I got a lot of that stuff out of my system. Cause I got to play with a lot of people I always wanted to, play with or pick their brain or you know so i got to see a lot of it and so i don't have a real focused answer for that question but i feel like 
I guess I realized that as that was winding down and I f- kind of felt directionless. It's like, well, I don't know what I want to do now. Like, I don't know right. like what, what kind of thing I want to do to like, you know, keep this going. Uh, like or it to wasn't fill, to fill that hole or something maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I ended up, this was kind of unfortunately around the time of the financial crisis. Uh, which is weird because now I look back fondly on that time period in New York, like just kind of scraping by and like having yeah. to account for every swipe of the Metro card and just, <laughs> you know, it was, it was awful, but it also kind of something kind of romanticized when I look back <laughs> on it. Like when I think about it, like, Oh, that was, that was kind of fun having to jump the turnstiles once every couple of days. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if you were alone, it'd be different, but you got, yeah. you have a crew in New York. Like that's, everyone's kind of in that shit. Yeah. together you know what i mean it's it's i think that's uh that's the part of that yeah absolutely so i i got a day gig for a while walking dogs and i did that part-time you know like in that i made a decent amount of cash and yep. when gigs started coming back after like the financial crisis was averted however ways that happened um i dialed that back and then i ended up taking like a part-time gig at the apple store in soho and um there's like two things that happened when i worked there that wouldn't have happened any way else even though it's possible they could have one of those things was um i met john mclaughlin and he heard 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 some of my music because because like he was having a hard time getting the the i guess the point of sale software was having some problems with connecting to the internet so he needed someone to vouch for who he was and i was like this is john mclaughlin man you know like yeah so then i told him we had a bunch of mutual people in common and what i did and he listened to some stuff and wrote me this really nice email but the second of those things um and this might have happened close to the time we filmed those courses way back man this would, would have been like 20 maybe this is 2012 or 2013 i can't remember yeah yeah but um Dennis Chambers was hanging out in the store because it was a hot summer day. San, he was still playing with Santana. And yeah. um, so I was just, the same hung, I just went up that, to him. That awesome Santana joke. Was it you that made that one on Santana's Maybe. birthday? It was the A minor and D7 want to wish yeah. Santana happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I think about that probably once a week, dude. And I just laugh my ass off. <laughs> the best thing ever. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Sorry, yeah, man. man. I, I mean, that's that's true, so though, good. right? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> truly. It's it's funny because it's true, of course. Yeah, <laughs> Santana's <laughs> awesome, though, man. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, but oh, but man. so Dennis was hanging there, and we have a bunch of mutual friends, and so I was able to kind of just start talking to him. But I ended up playing him some of like the record I was about to put out, and he loved it, and he like basically played it for a bunch of other people. And then he, he called me up on the phone and he was like, I want to, I'm going to try to let Mike Varney hear this because you know, oh, maybe nice. you can get a deal out of it. And it never came to fruition, but just the fact that he was down to help someone out was like really cool of him. And so I, you know, I haven't talked to him in a while, but we, we connected on Facebook and he sent me a message and you know, there's a bunch of friends of mine that know him really well, like Dana Hawkins knows Dennis really well and uh, a couple other people. So I got to meet him just in a way that wasn't like at the NAMM show or like some kind of busy musician thing. It was just kind of a chill day in New York, you know, and it was hot and he just was hanging out because it was really, really, like it was one of those really hot, disgusting days in the city. And (laughs) I think they were playing at Jones Beach or something. And, you know, like I think interactions like that are, are good to have. And somehow sometimes like that, and that was like when I was kind of almost done with that job. So it was like, you know, what? I don't care, man, I'll, I'll just sit here and like, you know, pretend to show them some, some Bluetooth speakers and we'll just talk about <laughs> music. It's like, watch how these things play my record. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, but it was, it was cool, man. So I don't know. I, I, I think the other thing to what, to what Jake was saying, like, um, there were a lot of people that were working at Apple at that time that were really, really talented that yeah. were doing other things. Like there's actors and um, comedians a, and like- I had a genius bass player once and he'd come oh, really? with like all, all his <laughs> Apple stories. He'd be like, mostly it's just people that didn't clean out their phone and their fucking memory was shot, right. you know? Oh, just man. like Just like porn 
you know, just yeah, their just, cash just is delete full. The, like, the yeah. 80 fucking gigs of your kids' <laughs> photos, you know, like it's just then you have a new phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. There is a genius that I knew and I he swore there was this woman that would like leave stuff on her computer for him to see. That's awesome. And <laughs> claim that there were problems, which is kind of messed up, but <laughs> it's possible. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. But that I, yeah, that yeah. job was weird, man. Like I met I met some famous people on that job. Like one time uh Philip Seymour Hoffman came in. Oh man, and, he's oh, the man. best. Oh, he was the best. He was he was yeah. cool. Um yeah. Gandolfini came in once. Nice, man. That was that was heavy. Like he looked yeah. really it was kind of scary seeing him, man. I'll be honest. Like he, it's hard after to not watching see him. the Sopranos. I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like it's it's the, that's the one thing I think I definitely appreciate about that city versus this city. Like no one really cares about famous people the way they do out here. Like New York, it's like like I remember. Uh, I almost felt like I was on a nod basis with um, with John Turturro because he used to take a Q train. <laughs> near where i lived you know because I, I was living in prospect heights i think he lived in park slope and a couple times i'd be like i'd nod be like well, you know i wouldn't say anything but just you know yeah yeah like you're you like know, i'm gonna leave back. you alone but we have, we're acknowledging each other yeah. yeah like it wasn't like dude why did you take transformers you know like why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a lot of fun with that one though but you could tell he yeah. was having a blast i mean when i when i was in brooklyn <laughs> i used to see de niro on the platform and i'm like i love that shit you know what i mean like yeah. and i'm like man de niro is taking the fucking subway you know what i mean and yeah. of course like it reroutes and you have to get off of it and it just sucks you know what i mean the subway is just i mean it's great but it also just it always fucks you like when you're coming back from a gig and it's like three o'clock and and it like stops at like Atlantic, and then you have to cross a street and then take another train. They're like, "There's track work. You have to right." Get, you know, just like, oh, I mean, I think you learn the true value of twenty bucks when <laughs> exactly. you travel at night because you're like, "Do I want to spend twenty bucks to get home? Yeah, or is it worth two hours yeah, of yeah. like snaking through this system that's being worked on?" Um, and you all you also see with drummers it's the funnier thing um because you start to see the evolution of the drummer that moved to new york from somewhere else they start <laughs> they with like a legit every gig they, they start with like a legit kit you know what i mean like a 24 <laughs> kick and all this stuff and then the by the end they're using like a converted it. floor tom you know what i mean or like 16s <laughs> stuff like yeah. that they're stuff like, automatically just... sounds better when you don't have to carry it exactly you know, that's yeah. It's like, it's what like, well, amp they you got have? a harky bass amp and a, oh, oh yeah. yeah, great. That'll work. Yeah. It's a crate. You know what I mean? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Crate. I love it. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Although we had Julian Coriel on and he was oh, saying yeah. that he had this crate amp in the studio that sounded amazing. So <laughs> I'm sure it's possible, man. I'm sure <laughs> like, you know, everything, you, there's a way to, to make it work. Yeah, exactly. As long as it has enough Watts, it'll probably work. Have you been writing at all and kind of getting your production chops up and just kind of starting or i mean you already had production chops but I've, have you been kind of like compiling something during this lockdown yeah i actually put a single out in march nice, um nice. i've been like teaching myself guitar for like i mean i've been playing guitar forever but like i actually been like shedding guitar mm -hmm. with some intent of just having better better handle on my ideas with guitar um just because I'll work on stuff um, for composition's sake and want to be able to fully realize the ideas. But I actually, um, I made a track that I liked enough to put out as a single as like the, you know, I guess the more progressive rock metal thing with Steve Jenkins and the Quacks with Flutter. Totally. I put that out uh, a month ago. And, um, you know, that, I think that's the one thing I've really kind of got dialed in this time period is like um i was already doing a lot of remote sessions and i already had some things that i liked doing for my bass tracks you know just as far as like figuring out like you know what what would i like want to use on it i kind of mm -hmm. made that move to universal audio so i use okay. some of those things now i don't always use that on my bass it just but sometimes i like it they have good stuff i mean you know i, I don't complain about them at all especially for their their all the uad stuff sounds great I like it a lot. I also like using some of that stuff um, on like the different instruments, but but um, as far as guitar goes, I got into using a few of the neural DSP plugins, which 
I like a lot. I think right. they sound. I found some things that sound really good. Um, so yeah, I got into mixing that stuff and then you know programming drums. That's always been something I've loved to do. I feel like that's been getting better. I've been like learning how to do different things with that, um, which is stuff that I just didn't explore when I got into it. But like there are things that kind of are just obvious places to go with it, like separating everything into its own channel. And yeah. then that's for that's that's if you want it to sound real for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So getting into that. But, you know, I, I make tracks all the time and and I write stuff all the time. I think some of it. It's more for instant gratification, like, all right, I'm going to make a video and put it on Instagram. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this, but I'll make it. And then some stuff that, that I think is better that goes in a different file. And um, that's kind of like the way I do it. But I try to make a practice of doing that at least four times a week, no matter what, even if it's not great. Yeah, just filling up the cup, man. Yeah. You know? And even if it doesn't exactly um reveal itself to be like an amazing thing right away sometimes it's something i'll come back to or revisit and yeah. um i just like being of the mindset that you know there's something to show for what i've sat down and 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 um you know come up with i always kind of equate it to like you know online like yoga posts it's like people i understand why they do it <laughs> where are you going with like, this well, because they'll like make themselves make sure they exercise that day and they'll usually post oh, I it. See. And like that's right. How they do. But it's it's one of those things where like if, if it's not on Facebook, it didn't happen. But like with ideas right. and creativeness, if you have an idea and you just let it go, it didn't fucking happen. So like you just screwed yourself. It's just like you yeah. just had a pointless idea. So if you, if you don't record it, like that's the actual true sense of that word. Like if you didn't record it and put it somewhere, it just didn't happen. And then it's gone forever. So it's yeah. like. I definitely, that's a big practice I think a lot of people should do, you know? Yeah. And there's also a difference between like documenting something because we can all document on our phones now pretty easily yeah. and actually mm -hmm. recording it, you know, to a rig where you actually have a decent preamp and you sequence at least a basic drum part or something. So you have the idea yeah. and you can flesh it out later. Like that's even more productive. And you know, there's there's so many ways people can go with their music too. You know, like some people get into licensing, like I did, or some people you just want to make a solo record, and sometimes you make a solo record and it ends up doing licensing work, um, or you know, you just end up getting internet famous, and that can also help. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen, but you know, the most important thing is just making something that you believe in and that you love, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's what I would. I think there's also a lot of power in making little, you know, even if it's something that's just small, that's like 30 seconds, but sounds good. I think there's definitely value in putting that stuff out there because I, I do think that people have control over what people know of their work, you know, like mm -hmm. if you want people to hear a certain side of your playing, there is power you know, one has in, in putting that out there. It's like, okay, if you want to hear what I sound like playing a P bass yep. or playing a fretless or playing on this kind of thing, you can put that out there and people can hear it, you know, for themselves. You don't have to wait. Yeah. They're going to listen like to the that right before they listen to a four minute track anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it's, it's, well, nowadays, it's the, yeah. like the, the music supervisor thing. Like if, if 20 seconds in, they're just going to ditch, you know what I mean? So yeah. it, it's actually like no, it's a more powerful tool than anything, <laughs> especially in a loop based kind of world with like you have like lo fi, you know, DJs and all that kind of stuff. Like it is hip. It's never not been hip, to be honest. So it's like, yeah, yeah dude. but also I'll, I'll like you throw down on a P bass for 30 seconds. Hell yeah. <laughs> but 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 regardless of what instrument it is, it's like I think, you know, your point, yeah. which is strong, is that you're you're pushing out what you want to be represented or you want to be seen as and that that's what the power we all have as as musicians in this digital age we can literally take something that we're not as known for and say i want to be more known for this and show people what you can do and just put it out yeah. there and if you can get enough eyes on it or in, in enough years i mean that's that's a that's a that's a very cool thing that we can do now that we didn't used to be able to do yeah 
I think that's probably something that has benefited me personally in ways, you know, I'm not totally aware of. Cause I know that like I've gotten calls for things through social media that have been cool, you know, or it's helped my cause. Like if someone can just look and see what's happening like, okay, yeah, let's use that guy. Right. I don't really know how other things would have manifested. Like I got, you know, like Chris Cheney threw me a session at the beginning of the year. And like, I know Chris a little bit, like we're cool. And I've never been the type of person that's like, yo, man, if you get something you don't feel like doing, like call, you know, throw my number. Like right. I, yeah. I've never really felt like that approach worked that well, but I definitely think, cause I just feel like, you know, guys that are guys and girls that like are busy in a scene and they're getting constant calls. Um, I think they know, like, if they know who the available musicians are that could do those types of things, like, I think they would find the right people to route that stuff to if they couldn't do it. I don't think anybody expects that people are, like, not looking for work. So it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know. I've never been comfortable dotting that I where it's like, yo, if you need someone, give me a call. But I don't know. I just, I think, I don't know if that's like. No, I think that's smart. Yeah, well, you do like, it, I mean, you do it I th- digitally. You're just reminding right. them that you exist. It's it's like I mean, Adam, you always yeah. talk about like when you're back in town, you used to have to call cats and be like, I'm back in fucking yeah. town. But with the right. internet now, it's just like, oh, Adam's back in town. There he is at like the coffee shop, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, you're right, dude. That's a good point. And, and, and yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I say that a lot. It's kind of like. I remember my friends used to do those cruise ship gigs or something, you know, and then they, they just, you just have to like show up at everyone's gig and be like, Hey, I'm back, <laughs> yeah. you know, if there's, yeah. if there's, but I mean, the truth is you don't have to say it. You're right. You know? And, um, I think that you were saying this or was it someone else, um, about the Victor Wooden thing as well. Right. W- weren't you kind of taken into that camp kind of the same way just by, you didn't ask to be part of it. Right. Or was that the way that works? So, that that wasn't his camp in Nashville. That was basically there was a thing I was teaching at Berkeley for years called mm-hmm. baselines. Um, and when Rich Appleman was still the chairman of the base okay. department, this was like a three day summer program, uh, and it was essentially something for generally like prospective students and maybe maybe like people that weren't sure if they wanted to pull the trigger on the five week program, mm-hmm. but they got a little bit of a taste of how Berkeley worked. Mm-hmm. And I don't know like how great enrollment was, but it always seemed like pretty decent. And it was always like a good couple days. And then when Rich stepped down and it was Steve Bailey, I think, you know, Steve's kind of like, a, um, hmm, how can I put this? He's kind of like a politician. Like he knows he's smart. Um, he's very smart. And he put, he put Vic's, he put Victor Wooten as like the face of it. Like, yeah. So it was kind of like the Victor Wooten um, base weekend thing. I don't remember what it was called. I haven't done one of those since 2017. But um, so that changed around me, but it was essentially um, mostly the same. But it was pretty cool, man. I mean, like I got to say, Vic's a really great guy. Steve's cool. Um, I like what Steve's been doing with Berkeley's base department. You know, I think – the thing that is really great about Steve is he knows a lot of people. So if there's an inf- if there's an interest of a particular thing, he know he knows people and can mm-hmm. bring those people in to speak. Whether it's like you know um, Ron Carter or like Justin Chancellor from Tool, like he, you right. know, I, I like that about what they're doing. I also think, and this is a deeper conversation probably, but I think if there was ever a time for music schools that have to fight to exist compared to what else is out there it's probably now and they you know? should have yeah. to because they yeah made a good especially amount of money. for the price <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah like <laughs> I, I just think you know at the end of the day like if someone told a kid well you could buy four Audis or you could go to music school and yeah. learn how to play jazz like i don't know what i would choose i i'd pick the 16 I mean, Olympic you're, rings man four Audis. you're <laughs> right it five, is five. like <laughs> I mean, it could be more than four <laughs> Audis, to be honest. I mean, it depends on what kind of Audi, yeah. you know. I mean, yeah. I think NYU seventy five a year. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's very. I know that's a very cynical take, but but like, no, no, I, I, I'm with you. 
you know, I I've definitely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you guys, so I know you went to Patterson. Me, right? I went to Manhattan School of Music. Manhattan, okay. And then but Jake, I, I, I only went I was for just, a year. I went to my backyard, UMass Dartmouth. Okay. <laughs> but we had a cool program. It was kind of surprising. We had, you know, like Jim Robitaille was a fucking Thelonious Monk award winning guitar player. We had a cat from Germany that was like running our department. He did like all the stuff on Jeff Buckley's Grace arrangements. Like he was a heavy jazz oh, that's guy, great. but older cat from Germany. But like it was, we were lucky. We were like, damn, it's my backyard. It's just a tiny little school. But it's all who you get and who you study with. And then if you actually exactly. do the work anyway. So it's like really right. you're paying for like, what are you paying for? That, that's the question yeah. you got to ask like when you, when you enroll. I mean, I was paying for location, you know, I mean, it was nice. Exactly. I mean, we, I started, I lived, I grew up in Jersey and then, you know, I, I was right across the bridge. So it was easy for me. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. or the tunnel, I guess. But I mean, you know, I was, I was, I tell people that I was working as I was in school and, you know, in New York, I was able to go in between and it was just easier because I always had work. I didn't move from far away. Yeah. It's an easy drive. And I had a car. And like, am I out here? Yeah. You're paying for the fact that you're literally working in all the major studios. Either either you're just automatically working there as like a, a runner or you're just in there like mixing. Like it's like crazy. So MI is wow. like, I mean, right. whatever the hell's going on at the school, who cares? You're, you're in fucking L.A. working in the working studios, you know. So right. that's what you're it's, paying for at that. Yeah. Berkeley, you're paying to be around crazy cats and hopefully bust your ass because it's competitive. You know, it's, yeah, it is. They're peers. That's what I feel yeah. like I got. Like the people yeah. I went to school with, that I was a, like kind of in there with. I think that there was value in that. But <laughs> hell yeah. But it's you know it's it's weird. It's hard to quantify what that is now because I think you know it's it's different. Because I, I, I really think I don't know. You know, it's like I talked to Charlie Hunter about this on my podcast, and he was saying like he'd rather give his kid like I think 60 grand and like point him in the direction of a mentor and be like, yeah. if you want to learn how to do this, mm -hmm. go follow this person around. And like, and I, th I think like that to a certain extent is important, but you know, I also think we're at an interesting juncture now where a lot of the old system doesn't work the way it used to no. because you've got people who have careers that really haven't done anything other than, be successful at YouTube. And yep. I'm not saying that as a slight. I just no, mean like true. there isn't like a thing where it's like, okay, like I guess I heard, I think it might have been Wayne Krantz talking about this because he used to teach at Berkeley when I was still living in Boston. Right. And I didn't, it's not like I audited his class, but my friend used to record the lectures where he would just talk about stuff. And um, as much as I love his music, and I really do, he's a really smart guy and he kind of has this like dryness to him that I think guys like us kind of like because we're East coasters. Like, right. but he was saying that like, there's not really anything like a Frank Zappa gig or a miles gig where you do those gigs and you got career after that. Not anymore. Even like the most minimal person in miles's history as a band leader could get a gig on one of these big jazz festivals. Easily. Um, and so now it's like, I, I think a lot of musicians, like maybe my age and a little bit younger, my, my first record is what got my foot in the door. I didn't like, that is how I got pl to playing with Vernon Reed and Fusinski. It wasn't, they heard me and called me. It was like, I called them. Yeah. Fuse saw value in what I did. So he started calling me for his stuff. And then he referred me to Vernon Reed and the shit just went on from there. But like, just even that was like a different paradigm. Cause you know, it's like, if you're, you know, if, I think for me and maybe like a lot of people that aren't related to musicians and don't know how it works, it's like you read stuff like the Miles autobiography and you're like, wait, so I gotta like ride in cabs with like people I admire while they get blown by hookers? Like what, what, you know what I mean? Like that, shit like that. And for those who, <laughs> who didn't read that book, that's true. That's what happened in the book. <laughs> Sorry, man. I don't know who the target audience for this. No, thing this is, is but... the target audience. A lot okay. of like hookers and blowjobs, and you know, this is what we're <laughs> looking for. Right, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah. there's not really a. Uh, I, I think I think it's one of the things where there's not really 
any rules anymore, but a lot of the things that quantify someone's like worth, quote unquote, it's like, well, they play with that guy, so they must be good. Well, you, you mean just yeah. like, I mean, the gatekeeper the position is gone. You know what I mean? Right. It, it isn't. I mean, there's no like. Uh, it used to be you like you're right. It was Miles. Um, it was uh, Zappa. He was right. He was the he was a huge one. I mean, Zawinul to a certain degree, or John McLaughlin. I'm trying to think of other ways people got gigs, got known. You know, I think I think that mm. that had to have been the way a lot of stuff works. You know, and or you know, if someone's going to bring someone on the road um, and kind of put them on that way. Uh, like, I don't know if that happens the way, the way it once did, but I, I just think if you're just a musician that can be a musician for hire and maybe you're creative also, it just seems like the paradigm is you do your own thing now and you call who you want to have on it. Or it's like, it's with your homies. Like, it's like, you know, I know this is probably like old hat to most people, but like the snarky puppy thing, which was just, you know, they, they, did the tried and true get in the van, play everywhere, say yes to just about everything, you know, besides yeah. being a great band. Like, that's the yeah, part everyone thinks. They were also a really big band, which you, we all know is impossible to pay everyone well, you know, yeah. when you're starting yeah. out. So, I mean, that yeah. that is like an anomaly. Like, the fact that they made it, it's, like, inspiring. I don't know. And it's hard to talk about it because who knows if that paradigm will be rescued from – what I'm afraid will happen in wake of things being kind of on hold, you know, cause I'm, I don't know that this is to be true, but it seems like for a lot of people that are independent that don't work with the bigger promoters, if the bigger promoters are the ones that are giving these clubs the lifeline, what's going to happen to the little guy? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what I worry about. Yeah. They'll, they'll just take everything. Right. Like are people, is everyone going to have to bow to the altar of like live nation, whether they like it or not, like just to play like the small places, you know, like is it live nation presents like Michael. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's that awful saying of when there's, you know, when there's blood in the streets, you fucking buy everything. And that's, I mean, what these, I'm definitely hoping. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping for the best, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've Jake and I have talking about how the the system or the relationship between musicians and club owners was already broken. So this is maybe giving us a time to heal that or at least understand each other because, you know, both of us are in trouble now. Um, the club owner is in grave trouble if they're still open. And uh, the musicians need to understand um that it's going to be a slow process to rebuild this. It's not just going to be like, all right, COVID's gone. Like here that you're going to still going to get 250 bucks for this gig or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's going to take a minute, man. And it's going to be weird. And it's important to, to do your own thing and to, and come up with multiple income streams if possible, of course, because that's, yeah, that's, that's always a, you know, if, if, no, if learn nothing else was learned from this, uh, that, that would be, you know, there's nothing wrong with people being a little more proactive about mining the store. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I definitely don't want to never tour the world again. Like I definitely, even if I was sort of maybe in a place of like, well, I don't know if I want to do this forever. I I hope that chance comes back and I'm looking Mm -hmm. forward to the day that it does. But I'm also, I'm not going to like lie and say that I was, I think one thing I'm grateful for, and this is going to sound weird, I didn't have some kind of amazing tour on the books for 2020. I think that would have been really heartbreaking. Hmm. I'm kind of glad that I was serving a place where it's like, well, I feel good about music again, and I feel good about the possibilities. You know, even like the last gig I did before it all ended was a great one, you know? Nightmare scenario for for COVID, though, because it was like no stage, surrounded by people. Right. Uh, I was playing with like Mark Letary at this ho- nice. it's like a hotel club down in downtown LA, but it was a great band. We had a good time. All the homies came out, but it was yeah. also like surrounded by people. And I would say this was like where I was washing my hands in between sets, but meanwhile, not realizing that like there's faces right in front of me, like breathing yeah. out. I have faith. I mean, we're, we're getting close to, you know, to the end of this and it's been awesome 
to to rap with you, man, because like I like I said, I know that obviously you're you're a great musician, but you're also an intelligent cat, and you're always thinking. And you know, I love Thanks. that stuff. But you know, I do have faith, and it's not just me trying to do that to be positive on a podcast. But I do have <laughs> faith that art will come of this, and that um, there will be a way and a re a rebirth of some kind, um, a renaissance. <laughs> but it's going to take a minute and people can't expect the same thing. And to be honest, like we said, the system was kind of broken. People, the club owners, the club owners were mad at the musicians. The musicians were mad at the club owners. Like, you know, people were getting more into house concerts and trying to do their own thing. So, you know, it's up to us to make people want to listen again and make people want to come to the seats and to make creative music. That's not the same thing. So I think that it's important for us to, you know, be ourselves and to, to be better and you know because we have to, ultimately we have to get a fan base and if we can do that we can control everything if people yeah. want to see you you could do it at your house you don't yeah need a club, you know so yeah i i think that kind of freedom is what interests me more than bragging rights because you know you're on like jimmy kimmel with some band that you're touring with. I don't know, not that that's bad, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm with you, yeah. That's just like, yeah, that is a status symbol almost. That is something that can be seen and that, you know, endorsers love, of course, you know what I mean? They love yeah. that and big social media numbers, but that's not, you know, that's not like true enlightenment or, or happiness. You know, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes with any of that stuff. So you just gotta do you and do it the best you can. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a trite way of putting it where it's like, I think just having the ability to say no, but I don't know if that explains the actual sentiment. I think what wears on me and it probably wears on a lot of people is that little voice that tells you, oh, you should be doing this because this is what you're supposed to be doing. Like if, if the minute that stuff comes in there is when I think a lot of stuff gets corrupted mm -hmm. um, because sometimes that stuff pulls you off the course that you should be on, which is yeah. like, staying true to yourself um and it doesn't mean that like there aren't things to consider because there are a lot of things to consider with music you know but i i do think sometimes that stuff i know whenever i've been my most unfocused it's been when those types of thoughts have consumed the way i assess my decision making and and professional uh you know goals and stuff you know and I always feel like it's the most disingenuous place to be um, sometimes. I mean, ultimately, like if you're you're a musician, um, there are very few of us who are making a mil millions of dollars doing this. So if you're compromising your vision, you know, it's it better be for a good reason. Right. I mean, and, right. and you know, and sometimes it is sometimes you get a gig that's paying so well that it might not be your favorite thing and you're going to put off your solo project and this other stuff. But it, you know what you can, if you can buy a house from it, do it, you know, um, right. By all means. But if it's not that, you know, you have to do some soul searching. I think that that's a really, really cool way to leave this off, man. And like, dude, thanks so much for being on this. I haven't seen you in forever. Um, we texted yeah. back and forth like randomly. Um, right, right far and far and few and far between but right. um man it's great and like you know i, I you're, you have a great perspective and I'm, I'm glad you can make it out and and do this or make it make it into that room wherever you are you didn't have to make it out right we're all virtual <laughs> right thanks for having me man this is fun right on brother and uh you know hopefully we see each other soon man yeah absolutely all right man absolutely Questions, comments, episode ideas, hate mail? You can get in touch with us by contact form, email, or voicemail, all of which are available at our website, theperformerspathway.com. If one of your questions or topics makes it into the podcast, with your consent, of course, you'll receive a shiny new $10 gift card for use at mymusicmasterclass.com. That's our sister website, which contains over 600 original educational videos from your musical heroes, so uh, we look forward to hearing from you. 